Okay, first, you guys... Wait, I asked and you guys answered. That's right. Or you asked and I answered. No, I asked and you answered. Now I'm, I'm answering your questions that you submitted on Instagram. If you want to follow me there, at the free outside, I have way more followers than this podcast. But thank you for joining in, you loyal audience. We are just going to the moon. Okay, I put out a question for... I put out a question for you to ask questions, and I would answer them live on the podcast, but recorded because this is a podcast. So let's dive into these questions that you asked. 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 Did I didn't do my uh, vocal warm ups? Okay, I'm gonna leave names out of this because, as you know, it's sometimes hard to say handles, Instagram handles. So these are all from Instagram. So thank you at the free outside. What leader pack do you use for multi-day fast packing? Great question. So I think you have to think of a lot of different factors. It's not just a one size fits all. Um, I've been digging a 28 liter recently, but that is for probably three season um, hiking. It is got a waterproof interior. So there's back mesh and a harness system that can hold water bottles up front and then side pouches on the side. So it can hold quite a bit of gear for 28 liters But if it was more winter, I'd want something with more capacity, which you can still go fast packing in the winter. You just got to add in a layer. Uh, I have in the past used a 30 liter. Um, I actually like some of the cottage brands out there that are frameless because even if it's like a 30, 35 liter somewhere in there, you can cinch it down further. So say you have 20 liters of gear, then you can make it smaller. And some of these weights are pretty comparable to the smaller packs as well. A few brands off the top of my head, Nashville packs make some really good ones that I like because they're adaptable to what you're carrying. Um, Hyperlite's new one. And then Gossamer gear also has some that are in the high thirties, but I found they're quite light and you can roll them down pretty far. So multi-day fast packing, it does come down to how much water you're carrying and food. Cause that can add to the weight and I have tested a few fast packs to failure, actually, so it's possible that the straps will break or any of the webbing. If you overload it with weight, I'd say more so it's a weight concern than a capacity concern, in my opinion. All right. Thank you for the question. Fast packing for anyone who doesn't know. I think I talked about it on an episode. Maybe I didn't. But it's basically a cross between running and backpacking, but it's mostly just through hiking where you're trying to be as efficient as possible, get to the places you go. There's no set pace you have to be going, no anything, but the focus is on light and fast for whatever your speed is personally so that you can enjoy more of the places. I like to describe it as you fast pack so that you can spend an hour at the lake versus 10 minutes if you're on on more of a backpacking schedule while at the same time covering like 60 miles in a weekend. So you can cover as many miles, spend as much time as the places you want to spend it, but just moving efficiently between them because you're lighter, faster, more nimble, and just have what you need, not much more. Did you like ultras better before you knew what you were doing? Why? Um, I think I did. So my first Coca Dona, I didn't know how drop bags worked, didn't have a crew. I only got a pacer by texting a friend in Phoenix during the race, and he came out and paced like... 80 miles, shout out Bryce Brooks. Thank you. Aravipa Racing, what is he? I don't know, manager? Something like that. But I think I did like the adventure. I've liked all the adventure of these things. And then I seem to add in a different wrinkle. So by going straight into my first one was a 50K. So that barely counts. That's like six miles longer than a marathon. Sorry to anyone who's run a 50K. Jump up to 50 mile and then hit me up. Just kidding. The rut just happened here. That's a pretty hard one. Um, But I did like the adventure. The uh, unknown of attempting something new is what drew me first to through hiking. And then I transitioned into longer through hikes, like an 8,000 mile one. Read my book, Free Outside, Anywhere Books Are Sold. Probably mostly on Amazon is where most are sold. And then from there, I moved into speed records, FKTs. And then I went into... The Barkley Marathons, also an unknown. Then ultras, and I did fixed time ultras, uh, last person standing ultras, 250, 100 mile, 100K, 50 mile, 50K, 10K, 5K, triathlons. 
I just like the unknown. So I think that was the fun part of ultra running back then. I just didn't know what I was doing and I just had to grit out Cocodona 250 kind of all alone. I don't even think that many people knew I was doing it. I just got an entry into the inaugural year, went down and did it, and it opened up my eyes to this whole new community. I love the community, but I am in the process of finding adventure again. So that is actually a pretty insightful question and one that uh, deserves some pondering. That unknown and unlocking something is, I think, the draw to these ultras for a lot of people and progressing in distance. The reason a lot of people have, well, not a lot. Some people have like a hundred ultra marathon finishes on the results page is because they're like addicted to them. So I think there's a difference between that adventure and addiction. And I think I just, I'm going to search out new races, different ways to do them. That's kind of a draw of uh, the ultra scene is there's so many different styles. And I was just thinking recently, sorry, I have like a dry mouth or something. And I've been thinking about that recently of, I haven't really raced anything in the cold or the winter. So it would be fun to go after that new terrain in challenge, or maybe get back in the FKT game game. I've been thinking a supported FKT would be pretty cool. So if you ever want to support a supported FKT of a major trail that I'm planning in the back of my mind, hit me up, Jeff at freeoutside.com, or you could just send other questions there. When are you running Bigfoot? Well, I have a tattoo of Bigfoot, so I've been running around with Bigfoot on for quite a long time. I would say the other 200s, I'm not sure. I'm, it's going to be like the calendar year Triple Crown. I'm either going to do all of them in one year or not do them, I think. So I love doing Cocodona every year because I'm friends with some a lot of the people that organize the race. A lot of friends still run it. It's just a cool draw. My aunt crews it every year, so it's a fun chance to interact with her over something really hard because she's been a pretty big support for my whole life. So that is TBD, but if I do, look me up because I'm probably doing at least the triple crown of two. Where's the where where's where where's the center of the universe? Wow, is it like a black hole or something? I don't know. I haven't really uh dove dive dove in diving into this for uh quite a while since probably like physics in college which i is it physics astrology astronomy one of them one of them in college which i did not attend class very much i'm just a good test taker so hashtag blessed um so i don't know maybe it's the white house of america that's what we seem to think here but I don't have a good answer to that question. We're just all little blips. Chase your goals. Don't put what you want to do, who you want to support as number one in your world. Worry about all the other stuff later because the world's too big. The universe is too big. Who cares? Spend your time on here wisely. Go after that big goal if you fail. Who cares? I've failed at so many things. And this year I've publicly failed on this podcast and told you guys about it. So if I can do that, just chase your goals and don't really worry if it's a ball of cheese in the center of the universe or... A bunch of people who didn't accomplish their goals because they were too scary. So just go after it. If you fail, you can make a new goal. No big deal. How do you afford some of these races? Dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign is wild for some. Totally. 100% agree. So I paid for some, paid for them, I guess, for th three of, I don't know, the last year and a half, I have been lucky to have clothing sponsor John G. So I make content for them, do some travel trips where we shoot different product and stuff and get paid some from them. And in exchange, I get a stipend to use for races and travel. Uh, before that, I paid for most of them, or I would offer to do a sort of trade. So in the past, I have written articles about a race not for a publication really, but for maybe their website, or I've done series of blog posts for them that highlight how to do it or the breakdown of the race, or I hosted uh, four guest spots on a podcast for Coconut in one year, and that was in exchange for a race fee. So I live pretty frugally, so I'm always searching out these options to lessen the cost to get into some of these races. Um, I did get some paid for through being on the Air Viper racing team for a year last year, Not no longer on that. Um, but yeah, very 
honest and stuff uh, for the first couple years, paid for them. And then after that, um, paid for a couple, but for the most part, do it's part of my career. Don't tell my parents I have a career, but full honest, full honesty. That's how I do it now. They are expensive. Some have payment plans. Um, if depending on who you are, where you're at in your life, uh, how much you want to put into it, uh, there is always that option. A lot of these races do their own marketing. So you could propose some sort of real content write up or something to the director of the race organization in exchange for a percent off or something. Um, yeah, there's, you can, we're in the most creative time ever and you can just ask things like that and you never know, you can be flexible, figure it out, maybe cut out that latte. It's kind of how it goes. I mean, same things I've wanted to get LASIK for two years and I have not done that. Can't find a sponsor for that, I guess. All right. On to the next question. Will you be working on any movie projects? What do you do through the off season to stay in shape? Okay. Will I be working on any movie projects? I have no movie projects going, but I'd love to get one going. I mean, hit me up. Um, yeah, no real plans. I thought it would be cool to make a film about Cocodona through the process of it next year, but I don't have any plans and nothing is in the works. I just think it would be fun to showcase. It would be year five of doing it. I know the course pretty well. I know what I'm getting into and it'd be fun to bring people along on what goes on during a 250 mile race like that, especially since I've done it before and hopefully can share some tips, tricks, techniques, and ways that maybe you can do the same thing or do the opposite. If you see me make a mistake, what do I do through the off season to stay in shape? Um, so as a coach and now a self-coached athlete, I'm experimenting with a few different things this winter. Last winter, I so I usually schedule a speed block, or at that time I had a coach, and we put a speed block through the winter, and this basically means less volume, but more emphasis on intensity. So say I normally run 80 miles per week, I might drop that down to 50 miles a week and put in one to two speed sessions a week, usually every four days is a pretty good schedule for that. Um, one off day, maybe two, and then, uh, go from there. So I schedule it so that winter has less running, especially in the elements. Um, these can even be done on treadmill and this winter. I'm going to incorporate some more cross training. Uh, there is a pool in town and I have access to a gym that I will probably be doing a lot more biking and I'm going to try to up my strength uh, work out a little bit. I usually do 45 minutes twice a week. That can be sometimes up to an hour. So maybe an hour and a half to two hours total a week. I'll probably bump that up to three hours a week because there are a few areas that I think I can just strengthen, be a little bit more durable and stronger as it comes to some of the things I want to do next year. Hit me up on that unsupported, uh, FK or that supported FKT attempt to support. Um, the other thing is I found heat training to be pretty beneficial year round. So probably sauna two to three times a week, uh, hour total there. This adds up. This is, this is probably, I don't know, a lot of, lot of time here. You don't have to do all these. The more I'm saying it, it's like, oh my gosh, how do people have this much time? You do not have to do all this to run 200s and do all these things. This is what I like to do. It's part of my enjoyment, mental sanity at the same time as it takes up probably 20 hours a week of all these things, but I do get kind of paid for it. Um, this question, who did you hike with in this video? So that was from the post. It was us on the Ruby Crest Trail. It was my friend, Airborne, John Schwartz. So I guess I should shout him out. It's J-O-N-S-C-H-W-A-R-Z-E on Instagram because he apparently wants some publicity. So I hiked with him on the Ruby Crest Trail, and that is where this video is taken. So there you go. That was easy. What are you afraid of on the trail? I think I'm just afraid of running out of water or heat stroke or overheating. Um, the first time it happened, I was crossing Joshua Tree 
Uh, it was like week one of the Great Western Loop. I ran out of water, started getting really hot, had to set up the tent and lay down and just like do nothing till the heat of the day was over. It was some mild heat stroke looking back. On that same trip while up in Montana, I was crossing the a ridge line and I neglected to fill up with water before starting that. So I ran out of water with about two hours left. I think it was maybe 10 miles to that water. I tried to run some. I tried to hike some. I had such bad cotton mouth. I've, yeah, such bad cotton mouth. It was the worst. Um, when I got to that water, I didn't even filter and cows were all around. I was just so thirsty. I stuck my head in it and just drank and I did get Giardia later. So filter your water. Um, also just Cocodona has given me mild heat exhaustion. Is that come before heat stroke? I think so. When I've done it there too. So that's a pretty painful experience that I do not want to go through again. So I'd say it is probably a mild fear. Beyond that, I feel comfortable, unfortunately, being uncomfortable with things like being out of food, um, moving too fast, stomach issues, anything like that I can deal with. Um, I don't know. Maybe the other thing I'm afraid of, the say outside, afraid of on the trail. I don't know. I'm Maybe people. Yeah, I've uh, had to hitch just for situation. I know it's not good uh, with people who were drinking multiple times because it was like a rural road and I hadn't seen a car in hours to get into town to get food, especially on the Pacific Northwest Trail. It's interesting, interesting terrain up in Washington. But I would say that's pretty scary. A gun was pointed at me in New Mexico in my tent. It was like one in the morning. I was in there and these guys pulled over. You could hear the doors open and you could hear they were peeing. Of course, when the car pulled over, I woke up because I'm a light sleeper. It was midnight and I'm in my tent. They're peeing and they're drunk. And then when they see my tent, they drunkenly yell like, oh, we see you over there and we got guns pointed if you try anything funny. And it was like, what? What would I try that's funny? So yeah, that was on the Grand Enchantment Trail. And I don't think that trail gets many through hikers. So they were not used to people recreating near where they were peeing with their guns. So people, what else? I've had um, coyotes circled my tent on the Arizona Trail. Actually, it was the training for the Arizona Trail. I hiked 300 miles on the trail as a way to get myself in shape to go for the record, which I got, spoiler alert, I should do a podcast on that record. But they were circling my tent and howling, and it was pretty wild experience. A uh, little scary when there's like 50 of them. It sounds like they're right around you and that you might have to fight for your life because I'm only protect protected by a thin layer of a uh, nylon or some whatever my tent was back then. So that is scary. I've been charged by grizzly and moose. Survived. No big deal. Come on, get off my back, people. I know how to live out there with the animals. I'm more comfortable there than in society. Uh, maybe I'm just most afraid on the trail of having to return from the trail to the not trail. I haven't been on... I need to go on a through hike this winter. Wow. Hit me up. Which through hike should I go on? And I'll do a episode about that breaking down if I can or can't and how and why. And if I went on it, how I would do it. All right. Have you ever pooped your pants while hiking. Wow. And then he assumes I have because he goes, how did you handle the soiled garments? Well, I have not. I've had some very close calls. My closest call, dang it. I can never remember the name. It's like Port Clinton. Is that a town on the Appalachian Trail? So I was through hiking the Appalachian Trail, which I mean, that's usually a sentence people turn out, tune out after immediately because I roll Appalachian Trail through hiker alert. So I was hiking the Appalachian Trail, stay with me. And uh, I was like a mile from town and, you know, things are moving. It is go time. So I get to the hill and it's just a maybe a half mile descent now. I've held it in so far, 10 for 10, all the points, five stars on keeping my garments clean. And I get down the hill and there's a train track and then a train comes by. Like I'm... 200 yards from it. I can't cross safely. I have through hiker legs. I haven't sprinted in months. I'm not going for it. So I wait there. It's like, okay, deep breathing. I can, I can hold this. I'm going to be fine. It passes most of the way and then it stops and then it goes back the other way. And it's like, oh no, oh no. 
we're getting to go time. And then it stops and then it goes back the other way. And it's like, uh oh, we, we are not going to make this. So this is when it's like five alarm fire, four alarm emergency. I don't really know if those are terms, but if they are, it means I got to go. So I run up the hill, dig my cat hole real quick. I think I just dug it with my hands because it was wet, muddy soil. It was raining. I just had dreamed of using a, a real porcelain throne. And I, I made the deed. I made it happen. I followed all leave no trace principles. And I saved my garments for another day. That is it. I've had one sneaky toot. Can we say fart on here? I guess it's my show. I had one sneaky fart that I did have to change change my shorts once after okay with that those were your questions uh thanks for hitting me up um feel free to send any more questions jeff at freeoutside.com and we will go from there all right thank you guys for listening and as always stay elite my friends